According to the text, this is going to be explicit, detail type question. Why would a helicopter built for Earth be unable to fly on Mars? That's what we want to think about as we read this text proactively. In 2014, Amelia Kwan and her team at NASA set out to build a helicopter capable of flying on Mars. Because Mars' atmosphere is only 1% as dense as the Earth's, the air of Mars would not provide enough resistance to the rotating blades of a standard helicopter for the aircraft to stay aloft, so it just simply would not fly. For five years, the team tested and designed in a lab that mimicked the Mars atmosphere. The craft the team ultimately designed can fly on Mars, so really hard to fly on Mars because there's very little atmosphere to keep you up, but somehow they created something that did. So what's that? Because its blades are longer and rotate faster than those of a helicopter of the same size built for Earth. So what does it have? It has bigger blades and they move faster. So that helps keep it up. So what can we say about the copter? Because Mars and Earth have different atmospheric conditions. Why would a helicopter built for Earth be unable? Yes, that's it. The reason why a helicopter can't fly on Mars that would fly on Earth is simply because of the different atmosphere. It says so right there, okay? It can't stay aloft. We'll quick go through B, C, and D. Because the blades of helicopters built for Earth are too large? No, that's not right. That's mixing facts. They needed larger blades on Mars. Because the gravity of Mars is much weaker? I mean, you might know that that's true outside of outside knowledge, but again, that's not right. Not in the text. Because the helicopters built for Earth are too small to handle the conditions? Nothing in the text suggested that. That's not right. A is the correct answer. Okay, we've got another main idea question. Bicycles were first mass produced in the late 19th century throughout Europe and North America, allowing individuals remarkable freedom to travel longer distances quickly and comfortably. Okay, this freedom coupled with the affordability of the vehicle made the bicycle immensely popular. Individuals were able to live farther from workplaces, easily visit neighbors and towns, participate in new leisure and sports activities. Bicycling quickly became a popular social endeavor, with enthusiasts forming local clubs to enjoy these newfound activities. So what's the main idea here? It talks about how bicycles when they were first produced, a little bit of a history of the bicycles, they were first produced and their impact on the environment in Europe and North America it kind of changed the social structure. People are able to be more flexible and move around more. So the widespread adoption of the bicycle in the late 19th century provided new opportunities for people. That's true. It's very broad and a main idea should be a broad statement. I think that's going to be our answer. Let's check B, C, and D. The affordability of bicycles made it, no, that's not the idea here. Don't really discuss the affordability. I mean, it mentions it as a specific detail that's coupled with other reasons, but again, that's too narrow, right? That is not the main idea, okay? Always look for two narrow answer choices on main idea questions. They're going to be wrong. C, the popularity of the bicycle in the late 19th century gave rise to the first cycling clubs. Okay, that again is true, but like B, it's too narrow. It's just one aspect of the paragraph. D, the mass production of the bicycle in the late 19th century made it safer. Hmm, nothing really talked about safety here. A is the correct answer. The widespread adoption in the 19th century provided new opportunities for people to get around. According to the text, so we've got an explicit, whenever I see based on the text, according to the text, we know it's an explicit detail. So we're going to have a more focused goal here, our objective. We want to know about which piece of favela's art was on display in the Peterson Automotive Museum in 2017. Okay. So artist Favela explained that he wanted to reclaim the importance of the piñata as a symbol in Latinx culture. To do so, he created numerous sculptures from strips of tissue paper, which is similar to the material he used to create piñatas. In 2017, so that's the focus, note the place, location, time, 
of what we need to answer. Favela created an impressive lifeside pinata sculpture of Gypsy Rose lowrider car, which was displayed at the Peterson Automotive Museum. That's the other part. It's in the Automotive Museum. So which piece of art was on display? The lowrider was a famously driven by Jesse Valdez, an early president of the LA Imperials Car Club. Okay, what was on display was this car in the museum made of a pinata. So a painting of LA? No. A sculptor of a lowrider car? Yes, that's it. It's a pinata, but it's art. It's a sculpture as well here. So I think B's right. C, a painting of a pinata. No, it's not a painting of a pinata. A sculpture? No, it's not a sculpture of Jesse Valdez. That's just extra information. He's famous for having the car that the sculpture is made of. B is the correct answer. According to the text, so again, that's a tip off. We've got an explicit detail. In this case, that will be how old was the fossil that Wang and colleagues discovered? So, how old was it? Well, let's take a look. Sing Wang and colleagues have discovered the earliest known example of a flower bud in a 164 million year old plant fossil. So, 164 million years old in China. But we have another number here, so let's be careful before we go circling C. The researchers have named the new species such and such. They believe that discovery pushes the emergence of flowering plants or angiosperms back to the Jurassic period, which occurred between 145 million and 201 million years ago. Okay, so this is just the period, but the age of the fossil is 164. C is the answer. According to the text, so again, I'm going to have a specific focused goal here. What challenge did the researchers have to overcome to examine glyphs? So what did the researchers have to overcome to examine glyphs, which are generally, I think, sort of ancient Egyptian writings and drawings on walls or really even caves or for, you know, things like that. So anyway, let's go. In 2022, researchers rediscovered ancient indigenous glyphs or drawings on the walls of a cave in Alabama. Okay, not in Egypt, but on, on the walls. The cave ceiling was only a few feet high, affording no position from which the glyphs, being as wide as 10 feet, could be viewed or photographed in their entirety. So the question is, why would they paint these glyphs or write them where they can't be seen? However, the researchers used a technique called photogametry to assemble numerous photos of the walls into a 3D model. They then worked with representatives of tribes originally from the region, including the Chicksaw Nation, to understand the significance of the animal and the humanoid figures adorning the caves. Okay, so they said made more of a 3D model, um, trying to find out why, maybe explain this or the importance of it, but... They don't really tell us what that was. We don't actually get a conclusion here. So what was the challenge the researchers had to overcome? Basically, that these glyphs were in very small, unviewable places. So the cave was so remote that the researchers couldn't easily reach it. Didn't say that. Did not say that. Some of the glyphs were so faint, not about them being faint and unable to photograph. They did photograph them. The researchers were unable to create a 3D, didn't say they're unable to create a 3D. We know they went to, they tried to. We don't know if they did. We assume they did, but so that's not right. The cave's dimensions prevented the researchers from fully viewing the glyphs. That's it. 